the top three stories of the week. Welcome back to All That Jam, where music has no limits. We are here with the top stories of the week. How are we doing today, Amanda? Hi, Kevin. I'm doing great. It's been a, a really good week. You know, we are just cruising through summer somehow. And I know you and I are both very excited for Mondo Green, but we still have a couple weeks left. So, you know, trying to take it easy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Summer tour starts tomorrow for fish. Uh, a lot of excitement in the air. Uh, did you get a chance to see the tiny desk they released yesterday? I did with the tiny trampoline. <laughs> it was so cute. Trey is so cute. He's such a lovable guy. They are just adorable. And you know what? Even some of my <clears throat> goose friends who put together really funny memes, I don't care. I said, even if, you know, there are people out there who just are like rolling their eyes. You're doing it because they're adorable and they're having fun. And like, what's better than that? Yeah, I it just makes me so happy. I loved it. Yeah, it was fantastic. I got to talk to a guy, Mike Lowe. He's a friend of Wook Plus's and he was there. He got an invite. So he gave me some uh, on the ground. He said when they went in, they walked across the catwalk thing above the newsroom. So they got to see like the NPR newsroom was down there and uh, <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. So and then I guess, yeah, tour starting. He did the Mark Marin podcast which was very interesting, a lot about the recovery and stuff like that, and fascinating, fascinating to hear Trey talking so much. I agree with you completely, and yes, very um, kind of open, not that I guess I would say Trey has has ever come across as someone who's closed off, but yeah, just the, the extent to which Trey got into details and seemed to be very effusive and, and just going in whichever direction um, is a little bit different. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, I have magazine covers from the 90s in frames like that kind of stuff just doesn't happen very often for them. So um, I feel like those are notable moments. And he definitely seemed ready to share. Right. Now, now uh, did you hear the the Grateful Dead nostalgia mayor comments? I did. And, you know, as you know, I was I was there at this fear um, this past weekend, Saturday. Yeah. And so for me, that timing was, you know, was pretty good to maybe try to relate it a little bit to what I had experienced. I don't take it as, as negative, maybe. And, and maybe this is because I was able to see the show last Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, before I, I get into that further, I, I would like to know what you think. Did you take Trey's statements as kind of a dig or do you think he was just trying to explain I think he was just being very matter of a fact, matter of fact, because he said you could play with Noel Redding, but you aren't Jimi Hendrix. And I think that's what his whole point was. Nobody's going to be Jerry Garcia. And my thing with Den Company is they've never written a new song. They are a nostalgia act. And that's fine. They're creating new music in the moment, but it's all from stuff that's already existed. It isn't something from the ether coming forward or something. I, I agree. And I guess my my personal take on it, um, having seen the show, is to me, that feels like exactly where they want to be. I mm -hmm. felt that the show on Saturday was a love letter. It was and, and I say this and I'm just going to be totally honest, Kevin, and I don't really talk about this very much. But, you know, my age being what it is, I think I referred to myself as a summer chicken yesterday on a thread somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> Um, summer chicken but you know i missed i missed out on seeing the dead live by uh, literally six months because right. i started going to shows when i was 15 that was 1995 i you know that was in the plans all of that obviously didn't happen um but i've always been very reticent to comment too much or really even say a lot about the grateful dead because for some reason i just felt like i never really had the right to do that maybe i over respect that scene you're over respecting it you can comment on it <laughs> i i don't i mean i really don't ever i do comment on the machine around the music mm. like things shit like all of that i definitely have no problem talking about but but the music itself i've always felt like i really don't have a place there 
But I will say um, just sitting there and, and being with um, people who dedicated years of their lives, you know, in, a, in the kind of love that you have and just that f- whole body, you know, memory, right, experience, um, I felt like the show that they've put together, at least the one that I saw, was nothing but thanks for what has happened. I mean, money aside, <laughs> and that's the other thing too, right? I mean, obviously we know they're they're not doing poorly in this venture, and that's actually going to come up again in one of our top stories in a minute. But um, but still, I think that the um, the video component of the show was handled about as gracefully as it could be almost stepping into like cheesy territory gimmicky but not quite didn't get there definitely didn't get there but it could have um they're not fooling trying to fool anybody by saying right. that anything other than trying to i think just bring bring all of this to people who clearly want to hear it and feel it and see it so I wonder if they would even have an issue with being called a nostalgia act, because to me, that's exactly what it is. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, maybe mayor will comment I now that they yeah. didn't come these off for two weeks. Yeah. You know, and, and, um, I mean, I've seen Den company before, obviously, you know, the experience in Vegas is going to be different and, and it's hard to compare, but I, I really think he does a, a wonderful job of, bringing some of his own sound into some of those longer sections, you know, it's his voice. I don't think he's trying to be anybody else than him. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, that could just be me. And, and you know what, I would totally understand if someone's sitting there with a, with a lot more time and and years invested in seeing the Grateful Dead could have a totally different opinion, but I wasn't, I wasn't picking that up from anybody. I saw a lot of, you know, people really just engrossed in happy to have it. Yeah, happy to have it. And also um, for a lot of people, too, thinking back on their lives and and memories that they have. Yep, there you go. All right. That's a little emotional for... <laughs> it for- is. I, I think that dovetails nicely into your first story, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, okay. Um, so this first story popped up, um, oh my gosh, just uh, just this week. So um, longtime Grateful Dead lighting designer, Candace Brightman, um, who worked uh, for like the, the Grateful Dead organization um, for many, many years, um, has a GoFundMe out now that was um, set up very recently by Charlie Miller, um, the audio engineer, archivist, um, to help Brightman with financial medical issues. Um, in the call to action on the GoFundMe page, it says, She's becoming weak and unable to fully take care of herself, and she can't afford to hire people to help her. So Mm -hmm. that's the situation. Um, She was with the Grateful Dead family for uh, over 20 years, recruited by Bill Graham to work at Fillmore East. And she did a lot to set the stage for, you know, CK5 in in certain ways. Um, She actually had also helped design uh, the 50th anniversary shows, you know, some of the lighting design for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the reason we're talking about this today is of course, to just share that, um, because the GoFundMe itself has already surpassed its initial goal of $50,000. Um, well, well beyond that, they are around 56,000 right now, uh, almost 900 donations. So there's that, right? But what happened that I wanted to talk about, um, and I think this was in a Live for Live music post yesterday or a couple of days ago, um, many, many people commenting on it and it caught my eye because there was a consensus for a lot of the people posting that, you know, this woman should not have to rely on a GoFundMe to take care of her medical bills. She worked for the, you know, the Grateful Dead family for a long time. Um, why why is she not being taken care of by them directly so there are a lot of assumptions being made right well okay i worked for ace hardware for a good six years i turned that plumbing department around i started making all kinds of money and i left i don't expect those people to 
give me anything now because she left the Grateful Dead. Did she work elsewhere or did she never do anything else? I mean, not to take anything away from her. The same thing with Betty. The Betty boards <laughs> were found in a storage unit rotting away because she couldn't afford it. But, you know, when they worked for the organization, from everything I've ever heard, they had good health insurance. They took care of everybody and they probably had retirement funds. But when the apparatus shut down in 95 or whenever she left, there was only as much time as you work, you know, in the, in the world of capitalism, it, it, I don't expect them to do it, but on the other hand, um, dead and company at the sphere is making money hand over fist. They could have thrown her a hundred K. Right. Well, exactly. And so this is, this is kind of one of those philosophical conundrums, right? In a way, <laughs> because absolutely. I mean, I would never think of going back to anyone I worked for. I mean, I, I taught at the same school for 12 years. I don't think that they owe me anything. Right. We didn't even get pensions. You know what I mean? So like I so there's that part of it. I guess there's also in my mind, um, we we don't know what assistance she may or support she may have received. Right, right. I wonder what she's done in between then when yeah. she left. I, I, I don't know her story enough to say that she was there in the 80s still doing it, how long she was the lighting director. But, you know, I, I think a lot of people, myself included, are very bad at thinking about what happens when you're 70, what happens when you're 80, you know, what are you going to rely on? Because, again, capitalism Everything that comes in the door goes out the back door. Oh, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm a big proponent of life insurance. I mean, I don't have the kind of savings I would want, but that gives me some peace of mind, you know, right, but that's right. not going to take care of medical bills necessarily. Right, exactly. um, right. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting question. I, you know, I'm glad bottom line is I'm glad that this fundraiser was successful. Yes. No, God bless her. She, uh, she deserves, you know, to, to be able to exist in as much mm -hmm. comfort as she can at this point, because apparently she's not comfortable at all ever, but that's right. And we're praying for her. We are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say John Bell donated uh, a, d a really, you know, decent amount to this. And um, I think she had worked for panic for okay. a very brief amount of time. Um, so I'm sure she did other things, but in any case, you know, as as we all collectively get older, kind of, you know, our, our uh, you know, like generation, as we move through this, there's going to be a lot of us in similar situations, because it has not been a given that any of us are able to save the kind of money that we need, or even know how much we're going to need, period, right. that changes all the time. So, um, so yeah, you know, I'm, I hate that, things sometimes get turned into these kind of conversations, but I also think it would be impossible to imagine that that wouldn't have come up given the continued financial success yeah. of, you know, the organization known yeah. as the grateful dead. Yes. Yeah. So we wish her the best. Um, maybe what I'll do for the second story is stay within the sphere. Cause I really That's try right. not to have multiple stories like this, but I don't know. Um, just because this actually had come up, uh, a little bit recently. The sphere is the biggest thing in the world. Did you hear that the Eagles added more shows into 2025? Yes. They're up into to 20 January. now. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I mean, it's an it's a it's a good model for them, I'm sure. Um, it's a peaceful, easy feeling. Going to the right. bank. <laughs> Can't wait to see what they do with it. Um, so kind of sandwiched in between all of all of that, we have EDM. <laughs> so maybe yeah. that's why I kind of caught my eye. So um the first EDM show, so electronic music at the Sphere, will be New Year's Eve. I think it's going to be rocking. I will just say I I'm not like a a full on EDM fan, but I definitely do enjoy elements of that in music uh, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So um, they're going to have um, someone there, um, and actually his name goes. I think he goes by. Anima. I'm not 100% sure. A N Y M A. I tried to look it up. Um, he already has this this audiovisual show called The End of Genesis. Um, mm -hmm. and currently, it's just slated for the one performance on um, on New Year's Eve. 
but um, and his real name's Matteo Miller or Millery, I think. Um, so there's various collaborations within this um, set of albums that are kind of centered around this event. Um, but I am so excited to hear, you know, how this goes. He's huge. He's got millions of followers um, online. And I think that EDM is a really interesting way to take this because a lot of the really big DJs and EDM folks already have quite a lot of production at their shows. Right. And, and it's cheap. Mm -hmm. You're paying one guy a hundred thousand dollars or, you know, whatever it works out, you know, however much you pay the guy. Um, I also like the idea of it, that it isn't a classic rock thing. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm going to call Fish and you two classic rock things. Um, and hopefully it opens the door to a Beyonce or Madonna or somebody. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So um, some people were saying, well, why this guy? Because he's popular, but kind of mm -hmm. niche. There's There are definitely DJs out there, Diplo, others that are like, you know, worldwide. Household even, names. Yeah, exactly. Um, or even folks that perform at, you know, different festivals that are known for this. What I read is that a lot of them, um, not all, but a lot of them, those top DJs have um, residency deals with nightclubs already that are exclusive. Mm. Um, the other thing I heard, which kind of makes sense, is that maybe the Sphere wanted to kind of test this new genre model with someone who, again, will sell tickets, but isn't going to have the, the same level of visibility maybe mm. or attention that some of those real real mega star acts would to see how right. it goes so maybe a little less risky for them Ooh. i think it's great i love it i'm i'm stoked to see how it goes yes yeah, so we'll have to uh keep our eye on that maybe they'll add some shows or something if it does well that's what they did with the eagles four shows sold out really quick let's add four more oh, okay they sold out well let's why don't we throw on 12 more and see you know people are going to mm -hmm. jump at that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, so that's what's happening over there. I did hear a uh, rumor from a very reputable source that Bruce Springsteen has been out there several times, um, to just tour the venue. Take check it, it in. Mm -hmm. Right. Nice. So, yeah, I could see. I wonder that if thing. he's going to see dead and company. Maybe he did. If I, they need to bring Bruce out. Come on. Wouldn't that be amazing? Oh, I'd love that. Love so. Light. They could do I'm Love Light with though. them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so biased. It's my birthright. I have to be. Um, all right. Well, we'll see what happens with that. I know that they probably got a lot of good stuff in the works. Um, mm -hmm. Our last story for this week is a little bit broader. Um, I did not know that this existed. So um, I learned recently about um, a new music economy think tank that um, basically has been started by various independent music labels um, and it's called ORCA, um, mm -hmm. the Organization for Recorded Culture and Arts. So love a good acronym. Um, officially launched uh, yesterday, July 17th. And this is a first of its kind type of organization. They're calling it um, part of a global music ecosystem, which sounds very techy. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was reading stuff for uh, for my day job. Um, so these leading independent music labels from around the world. So this is this is a worldwide thing. Their mission is to develop and promote research data, qualitative evidence that underscores the significant economic, social, and cultural value of music. There's a mission statement for you, Kev. Yeah. A mouthful. <laughs> it is. Um, so uh, the labels that are part of this, you know, this first wave of Orca run from um, Because Music in Paris, France, Beggars Music. You've got kind of um, all over Europe, Domino Recording Company in New York, um, some Nashville-based labels, and then um, Secret City in Canada. So uh, a Sub Pop. Sub Pop was wasn't, there. yeah, Sub Pop yeah, was that, on there. Yeah. That was the one that... Um, I think is probably Jumped out. well known to a lot of people from, from the nineties, really remember those shirts. So, so what, what does that mission statement mean for those of us that don't read mission statement? Yeah. So um, 
I was thinking about this and I was trying to put some pieces together to conversations we've had around other stories, which is um, this idea of music being a business, but that right. often um, artists and then maybe, you know, even some of these smaller labels, even though these are powerful labels in the indie scene, they're still much smaller than any of the big guys, um, that knowledge and information is what's needed to be successful more than ever. Um, and so there's a statement put out, um, said the music industry is constantly evolving. One thing is vital, the need to invest in artist careers and support their work. So help independent labels build up intelligence on how to sustain the music, basically, mm -hmm. um, to share, as they say, economic benefits as broadly and equitably as possible. So this really sounds like an interesting thing. I, I really want to learn more about this because they're trying to get policymakers, business leaders, communities to basically understand at a deep level why music matters and why it should be recognized as its own kind of economic machine, which of course it is, but they're trying to do this in a data-driven way. Nice. nice. I think it's super cool. I'm I'm all for anything that can bring knowledge, you know, out there to help underscore other things. Yeah, we'll put some links to that and we'll it just started, so we'll mm -hmm. keep our eye on it and see what happens. See if they do make a change. Yeah. You know, sometimes these groups, because they're releasing reports meant to be very easily digestible, but that have data points to them, sometimes that can actually be a really good way to get people to be more aware of things. Yeah. Because yeah, it's a little, like it's left of the conversation of we hate Spotify. We hate, you know, right. it's more, it's going to be a little more focused, I think. Right. There you go. All right. So what do you have coming up next week? Anything exciting for the weekend? Uh, no, I'm going to be hanging home. I mean, there's a bunch of local shows here, but um, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything coming up around this area. I will be at Locomotion, which is in Northern California, and that's in two weekends from now. Nice. And then at, at Mondegreen, we're, gonna, we're trying to do something. We're trying to yeah. be in one of the cute little huts be able to say hi to some people so we'll let you know more about that in the coming weeks and i guess with that i will say stay beautiful but don't stay underground too long i'll see you soon amanda all right have a great week kevin